Let's start. Welcome everybody. This is the SEA and the Hidden Treasures of Knowledge. It's about finding resources for your arts and sciences, um, which is rather important, especially at this time of the year when the arts and sciences usually uh, start showing up in events. Uh, it's trying to find things that are appropriate for your style of art or the science, whether you are a scribe, whether you are a fighter, a brewer, a carpenter, you're always looking for sources to show how your art was done at the time period that that we play with in the SCA. Uh, this is a brief description of what I do. Um, I'm a herald in the SCA and a researcher. Modern, modernly, I am a interlibrary loan specialist. And I've been working in lib uh, library services for more than 40 years. So I'm kind of into the research anyway. Uh, and the fact that I have a mother and aunt who are also librarians. So we play a lot. Um, what is knowledge? Knowledge is that which is gained and preserved by knowing. Instruction, acquaintance, and I've been learning scholarship, erudition. It's knowledge as is described in the mission of the SCA is very important for enhancing the lives of the SEA members to events, demonstrations, and other pursuits. And it's really important. We all share knowledge. Every time we find out something new about our craft, we want to share it. Hey, this is how I do it. This is what happens when you do this. So that's very important. And then I broke it down into the different arts and sciences. And there's a lot more in sciences, including the uh, venting, brewing, meads, all that is one of the more, it's, it's usually based in the sciences because it has a chemical reaction. Uh, where do you find most of your research? You can find it in our libraries from your small town library to uh, city and county libraries, regional libraries. Uh, a very good place to go when you go to libraries, if you can't find it in your library, go to the interlibrary loan desk service because they can go out to other libraries and borrow materials. And one note, when you borrow materials from other libraries, especially for academic libraries, you get, instead of a two week deal at your public library, you can get up to six weeks to borrow uh, materials from other libraries. So that's a really good thing to know because that way it gives you longer to work up your research. Reminder that everything is not everything is on the internet because everything that you see, including my presentation, it was was developed by a person who went and did the research, and they then they uploaded it to the internet. So a lot of times you will have to go look in actual libraries for information. It's not all not always found in the uh, electronic world. And there's another description of interlibrary loan. It's called by different names, including interloan, inter document delivery, resource sharing, document supply. But it all means the same thing. And interlibrary loans, a lot of them can actually loan audio recordings, video recordings, some maps, microforms, sheet music, you name it. Um, my library loan, which 
I'm the head of, we even lo loan out um, coffee, coffee table size books. Uh, and a very large one uh, I once loaned out. So there's a lot you can get nowadays. It used to be not so prevalent, but it's a lot better than it used to be. Some of the sources I found have a multi-discipline um, list. The ones I have on this slide will show you different subject lists for different arts and sciences. These are really good because the, the people that developed them went searching on the internet, internet and found some really great information and then they sorted it like a library. So I would really recommend you check these out. Uh, one of the best online world catalogs that you can ever find is WorldCat. The WorldCat, this one is the public version of the bibliographic catalog that I use. I have more bells and whistles. But this is really great because it will give you the information on where different books and materials are found and you can save it into a list that you get a free account where you can save your list and you can, when you're printing them out, you can print them out by different bibliographic formats, uh, Turabian, MLA, um, APA, which is the American Psychological Association. And you can print out these lists and it'll literally make your bibliogra bibliography. So it's a really good source to use. And you, there's lists of there that you can uh, develop into a, a really great bibliography. So I would highly re recommend it. You can't order books from the catalog that you will have to go to your public or county library then to the interlibrary loan because they can pull all that information for you and ask another library loan the, the material. But it will tell you how far away that particular library is from your location. So you have an idea of just how far your interlibrary loan would have to go. Another great resources, there's a lot of online digital archives on the internet. A couple of these are free. Um, like the Internet Archive, they literally can present public domain materials, including magazines, uh, books. You can literally borrow a book online and use it for an hour and print some of the material. Project Gutenberg is one of the first projects where they digitized whole public domain materials. And I and there's also Google Books, which I forgot to put on here. Google Books project have digitized a lot of public domain materials that you, and when you look it up, you can literally find it in PDF form and then you can go search at your own leisure the materials you need. And I've seen the publication dates going back to the 1500s. So it's a really good resource to play with. There's a lot of art references out there. Um, Google Arts and Culture has curated a large list of URLs of different arts and culture sites. So it's a good place to go to locate stuff on medieval paintings, fiber arts and all that. Uh, Journal of Weavers and Dyers have, Dyers have a back issue index online. So you can go in there and look for the article and then you can go request it from your library loan. And then Google Arts and Culture has a huge collection of museum 
uh, websites curated. British Museum is a really good place and British Museum, you can set up a free account where you can get permission to download photographs of things that you're trying to get an extent primary source to uh, go with your research for your arts and science project, you can ask them to download with copyright notice a photo. And that will help your research and your, your research documentation be much better. Victoria and Albert Museum does the same thing. Metropolitan Museum of Art does the same thing. I believe the Louvre Museum does the same thing. A lot of their sources are in French, so you will have to uh, kind of get a translation on some of the things. They also have it with the Berlin Museum. And I think the Netherlands has one too. So they're really good resources. For digital images, and this is just a few I've found. They have catalogs of manuscripts. If you're a scribe, this is a good place to go because you will see the actual artwork on the manuscripts in the, in the British archives and Oxford and Cambridge and all that. And it's a really good place to go. And if you look at these first two, they are with the British Library because the BL is British Library. It's a great place to go. And then there's a, the uh, Medieval Digital Resources is done by one of the, the university libraries uh, that does a lot of work with uh, digital resources. Each of these is really good and important. And then I've slowly found different places for uh, performing arts references. There's quite a bit out there. It's just going and looking for things, uh, including music scores for uh, early period music and documentation. And then historical resources. These are really great. If you are a medievalist or, or you are a herald, whatever, these are really good because they have digitized a lot of the materials where you can search for a certain uh, historical document to prove a name or uh, armory that you're trying to register. It'll give you some information. For heralds, it's great because from there we can document your choice and get it registered much faster and easier. Automatics and heraldry. This is a really good one. This one has documentation on legal documents done in various countries. One of the main ones is the British. British um, from 1066 on started documenting their king's courts, county courts, uh, minor courts, major courts. They named it our like feet of fines, um, chancery rolls, whatever. This is a really good set. And this one, when they, when they did it in the 1066 on, in the 1800s, the British put it into print. They got all, they transcribed all this the rolls and then put it into printed materials. Fast forward to the 2000s, 1900s, 1990s to 2000s, all of the, much of this is now digitized so you can search by name and by date. You can find an actual person who's been in a court and they will put a date next to that description where you can document that that person's name was popular at the time of that court. 
So you can document that name and then you can document your, your name submission. So it's a really good uh, resource. A dictionary of medieval names from European sources is another great one because they actually find documentation in different sources um, from all over Europe. So it's cool. And then uh, the PACE also did a lot of documentation and digitizing of materials. And the National, National Archives is a very good source because you can find wills, you can find um, announcements, um, laws, whatever. You can find them and you can get a background on the documentation for a project or for getting your submissions done. So it's a really, really good resource. And then for scribes, I went, I went and looked at different areas on the internet to find multi-curated lists. Uh, of course, I did NCR for NCR scribal college first, but there's a quite a bit out there that you can find the information of how you would do a charter. Um, so this is a great resource to, for scribes. And then more, more resources, a lot more digitization of things. Um, the lineography will pull up for scribes, it will pull up the uh, practice forms that you can print out according to the calligraphy hand that you're trying to work up the scroll and be able to practice the hand and get it good enough to where you can transfer that to the scroll and fill out the scroll for the award being presented. Uh, there's quite a bit out there. Bolian is actually the Bolian um, Library in Oxford, and that's they've digitized a lot of the materials, and it's a really good place to go. And then more research resources. Google Scholar. If you're doing a documentation paper, it's the more sophisticated <coughs> Google site. When you use this one, it will find you more resources and actual articles that you can use in your bibliography of your documentation from scholar, scholarly journals and uh, researchers. This one is a good one to go because you can put in the search term and bring up a lot of information and very good solid information for your documentation. And then the rest of these are guides to finding more resources. Uh, this one right here, Medieval and Renaissance Studies, Open Access Resources. Open Access is where you can use a lot of the resources without having to pay any kind of subscription fee. Good place to go. Art Store is another place where some of the materials are, it's all art, graphics and pictures and documentation. But some of, some of that stuff is free so you can, you can use it for your documentation and download it and all that. JSTOR is another one. It's journal um, storage or some of that effect. That is a, Great resource. You can use it in Houston Public Library and San Antonio Public Library and University of Texas, Texas A&M. They have a subscription to this. So if you are a patron from one of the county public libraries or university, you can use this resource and print, do your searching and print out the, the actual article without having to pay a fee. Um, 
here in Houston, the Harris County libraries use this and so do the city of Houston. So this is a good way to find your uh, documentation uh, articles. And then I broke it down into the different Kingdom a &S divisions and, and their categories. Uh, when you're doing an arts and science pro project, you need to be able to zero in on what the judges are looking for. What do they grade on? What they score on? What would be more of a more, more reliable source? And each of these right here, and there's a couple more that I haven't put on here, where they have, a, have the, the list of the categories and then subcategories. So if you're doing leather work for book binding or leather work for a scabbard, they, it gives you more details of what they're looking for. And then they have the judging forms on the, these, these URLs. They actually have the judging forms that you can print out and look and see what do they get points for? What do the points they can take away from? This is a really good piece of information so you can refine your work on your, your arts and science project. So it, you can present it better, you can put more information without having to do extraneous wording. It's a, these are really good resources, it helps you a lot and it'll help you probably more likely score higher because you've put in the work and look for what the judges, judges are most looking for. And it helps you write your documentation paper because the better the paper, the more succinct the paper, the better the score. And then here's some more of the judging criteria sheets. As I said, you can find these as PDFs, print them out. <coughs> and use them as your um, source of information. Just what are we trying to cover? What are we trying to present to the judges? And each judge is simple, similar or different according to their level of uh, knowledge of the category you are working with. Hopefully you get a, the judge that, that's in your category and then some you get ones that are more of uh, diverse first knowledge. But these are great to use. And then I put in some fact bites there. How many libraries are in the, in the world? 2.6 million libraries, maybe more from smallest libraries to university libraries. How many books? Nearly 130 million books, give or take the past 10 years of printing. There's a lot on the internet, but not everything is on the internet. She will have to, at times, go for the more practical sources, which are books and journals and papers done by professors, papers done by researchers, you will have to look further if you're trying to prove a point or prove that this piece of art was actually popular at the time, the period you're looking at. But big thing, ask the librarian. Go to the reference desk at your public library or at your county library, or even at the university. You can go into your university library. You're allowed to go in. You can't check out all the books unless you know someone who, who actually goes there. But you're allowed to go in any library that you want, except maybe the special libraries and find it inf information. There's a wealth of information in these libraries and you're, you are free to go in and, and use it. You can't take it out unless you're a patron, but you can use it at, at will. And librarians love questions. 
There's no stupid question. Uh, I can guarantee that happened. My son had to find out how much, when he was young, had to find out how much the world weighed. And we called uh, the reference desk for the public library and they said, with or without people. So you literally can, they, they will look up the information and give you the information. Because they love reference questions. They love finding out, okay, what is this and what is that? What's the price of tomatoes in Timbuktu? They will go look for it. They will go to the end of the earth to get you an answer to your question. So it's a good place to go. They will help you find the resources to write a paper, present your paper, um, techniques to make your art, your ANS project, whatever. It's there. And questions. You get a muted will. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we're here. Um, I guess I guess you covered everything really clearly. <laughs> well, I work in libraries. I've been doing it since I was in junior high. So I know a lot of information. It's amazing how much I do know. Yeah, I, I know one thing that um, like you had JSTOR as part of your resources. And right now they've actually opened it up during the pandemic. There are a few of these that have opened up so you don't have to go through a library system in order to access it, which yes. I loved. JSTOR, uh, Hathi Trust. Mm -hmm. Hathi Trust right now, you can still do the COVID access. They have digitalized, digitized a lot of uh, books and materials like the Internet Archive. So they're making it available people to doing the research because when uh, COVID started happening, happening, the libraries had to shut down. We're still not full capacity for doing interlibrary loan and stuff because we still do, we deal with the COVID. But a lot of libraries are going to op open access materials that you don't have to pay a fee for, and you can use especially articles, because some journals on the internet, you have to pay a subscription fee to use. And it's kind of annoying if you're trying to do, a kid's trying to do a paper for high school, or a college student having to do a paper, and they can't access the journal articles. Right. Even just SCA research, it's frustrating. Like if you if you're not connected with the university, you just run into these paywalls. Um, yeah. Now there was a question in the chat. Can you go over the interlibrary loans one more time, and where do you where can you go about getting one? Um, let's see. <laughs> There we go. In a library loan, pretty much every library, except maybe some of the special libraries, has an, a document delivery interlibrary loan service. What it is, if you are a patron of public library, county library, city library, regional library, or an academic library, you can use a service uh, to find materials that your own library does not own because most libraries can't afford some of the journals, uh, especially like the chemical abstracts. Chemical abstracts per year for subscription is $2,000 a year to subscribe. So a lot of libraries pool their resources and share reciprocally uh, the resources. That's part of what interlibrary loan is, a uh, sharing. If you cannot find it in your own library, and that's one of the main 
requirements. If it's not loanable and usable in your own library, you can put in a request online or in person when we get in person to request that material. And you can get help from the library and to get the right information that you put, need to put in your request to send it out. What the interlibrary loan person will do is put into an electronic form of a database like WorldCat. We have more bells and whistles, but we will search that database and choose up to 15 library and libraries at a time to start the process of trying to get that ship and information or material shipped to you. And it's usually, we usually designate between uh, one to four weeks, depending on what their uh, supply requirements are. Once they get it, they will send it back. But books, they ship it to that library, to your library, and then you they will notify you and then you can pick it up. For articles, we have a platform that they convert the article into a PDF and send the PDF electronically. And then when it hits your interlibrary loan, they send it to you by email with a, a URL and a password. And then you can pull it up up to five times and it's good for 30 days if you haven't used it five times. That way, and it's free. A lot of the interlibrary loan is free. Like I said before, interlibrary loan, if you borrow a book from another library, instead of having to do two weeks if you did it from your own public library, they will give you four to six weeks. So that is a really good deal because then you can have the time to do your research without having to rush the material back. Um, an interlibrary, like I said, an interlibrary loan is reciprocal. That whatever you borrow from one other library, your library loans to that library and all that. And a lot of the libraries are in a consortium so we can get the material shipped and received faster. Uh, and in Texas, we have what we call Texpress. And it cuts down the cost of subscriptions and mailing materials and and delivering materials. Uh, so it's a great resource. There's a lot out there that can be found through interlibrary loan. And it just makes, and you can borrow microfilm at times. They may not let you take it out of the library because you have to use a microfilm reader, but it's there for you, your use for four weeks. So it's a really great resource. Um, you can do a lot of it from home because a lot of the libraries are going to online interlibrary loan where you can put in a request form. You can talk to the librarian and give them information and they can look for access to the materials. Any more questions? We have lots of time. <laughs> ah, here we go. Yeah, uh, like I said, inter interlibrary loan is a really good resource. It makes, it used to be where you had to go into your own library to get resources or have to drive to another town to use their, their materials. Uh, a lot of graduate students at U of H, University of Houston, used to have to drive to San Antonio to use the University of Texas uh, materials. Now, because of COVID, you can do a lot of stuff online. You can actually go into the and if it's digitized, you can look at the resource without having to drive 200 miles. So it's a great way to get your research done without having to 
spend a lot of money on gas. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, but like I said, I highly recommend using interlibrary loan in the libraries um, because it'll help your research to go a lot faster because you can gather these resources and then write your paper and then and also build your art project or your science project and get it refined it to the best it can be a best presented uh, resource. So when you go to the competition, you're ready for what the judge, judges are gonna look for and what they will discuss with you. So I would highly use this service. And, um, and like I said, since you can't get on campus uh, or get onto the uh, public library or city library, um, county library, uh, inside their, their inside a physical building, this is the next best thing because it keeps you safe, but keeps everybody informed. Any thoughts? Initial thoughts or whatever? We have lots. <laughs> I think that covers it. Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions or comments? Let's see. Hang on. Okay, we have a comment um, in the chat saying that Stefan's Ford Legium is a good place to start. Yeah, um, Stefan, I'm trying to remember his last name. Um, he curates a site where he gets information from different sources. Um, and he curates it into uh, different subjects. And there it used to be uh, emails and he also gets papers from a lot from a lot of people have done arts and science projects and then he curates a list and every month he updates his database for more information as he receives it that's a good place to go because then you get people that have actually done some of the legwork for you and you can pull up that information and say oh, okay that's how that's done Good place to go. Uh, I highly recommend that because it's a good starting point. Wikipedia is another curated site. It's a lot, it's heavily used by a lot of sources and not always um, so sophisticated because anybody with an opinion can with an account can uh, upload information. So you have to use it as a general starting point. Uh, and then they do list resources, URLs, uh, bibliographies, whatever, that you can go further in your resource, research for your ANS projects. For Heldry, it's a starting point, but work with your Herald to get better documentation for your name or the elements in your de device. Because like I said, uh, Wikipedia is a great source, I love it, but you have to sometimes take it with a grain of salt because so many people can add things to the information that may not be, Totally accurate, but it's a good place to start. All righty, anybody else? I have 15 minutes. Uh, any thoughts? Whoops, here we go. Chat.
Yes. Um, I wander around a lot of SCA Facebook groups because I like looking for information and see if someone has found something that I haven't thought about. Um, as a herald, I start looking at other places to find when I'm trying to document a name for a Samir, I try to find out who else has documented that name. Where did they find it? And it's a really great thing to just start working with uh, searching and you can find that, that internet, the internal letter of um, What do you call it? An internal letter of uh, a decision meeting to see where they got the documentation. Can I use that documentation to document my submitter's name? Is that some, that submission name accurate? Well, so that when you work up the information for that submission, the more information you have, the faster it'll get registered. Because once you go, go local and then go to Kingdom and then to Laurel, the more information you have on that submission, the faster it'll pass. So I'd use that a lot. I look for, for different. The website for the help with period names, um, just a second. Let's see, where did I go? Come on. Where are you? There you are. This one right here, Dictionary of Medieval Names from European Sources, is excellent. It has a list of all the names, a lot of majority and period, that were in European sources, uh, documents, court rules, whatever. And once you click on that name, it'll give you variations of that name according to the time period. Was it done in 1242? Was it done in 1580? And when you click on the URL, it will show the actual resource where that was found. And you can use that resource, which it has a dated example. You can put that in your documentation of your name and that way the other heralds will know this is where this is found. This is a reliable source. So this dictionary of medieval names is your thesis, your piece of, sources is used by a lot of heralds. I really like this site because it gives you quite a bit of information. Okay. Um, I know there's, I'm not a costumer, so I didn't really look with that. I know there's a lot of costuming uh, research sites. And at some point, I'm going to get all my links and turn them into a big document showing different subject uh, sites. But there are a lot of costuming resources. I will have to look it up. Because there's a lot of const costuming people in the SCA, uh, including our, our Queen of Anstiora. She, she makes her own clothing and for herself and her husband and helps the king too find clothing. So they, they have done a lot of research and they have actually also done this research into arts and science competitions. So my next time I do this, I'll probably find more research on clothing. It just, I don't, I don't sew myself. So I have to go look. <laughs> Yeah, um, Pinterest, Pinterest actually, if you dig hard enough, you can find the original sources 
because somebody's put the research on Pinterest and they have researched books and um, paintings and clothing. Like the Victoria and Albert Museum has a huge costuming uh, museum. And you can download the information and look for the research that other curators have to use. That is a very good place. So, and I mean, Pinterest is a lot of general stuff, but if you dig hard enough, you can find someone who's done the documentation. And then you can build on that to work up your own uh, arts and science clothing uh, project. It's a good place to go. Because I do jewelry. I make jewelry. So um, I am working on making, doing arts and science project on jewelry that's done in the Byzantine time period. And you can go to the British Museum, to the Victoria and Albert Museum, to the Metropolitan Museum, and they will have photos of Byzantine jewelry. So the museums are great. There's a huge amount of museums out there. Right now, you can go into any museum you want. They're all online now. A majority of them are online. So you can actually see the actual object you're trying to document and present as your arts and science thing. So start looking. Talk to a librarian that love to help. They have they have fun with questions. I hope you all had a great time with this class and um, keep researching. All right, thank you so much for teaching. You're welcome.